History is important. History is so vital and core to what a nation is and to where that nation is going. Today, we give respect to all who died in defense and in protection of their nation and of their country. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. It's up to us to make sure he didn't die in vain. This morning, our scripture is found in John, the 15th chapter, verse 13. <clears throat> it is a verse in the context of Jesus teaching that we want to release from the pages this morning with the help of his Holy Spirit. It is a verse that perhaps many of you have heard and even some in society have heard, but they're not aware that it's found in the Bible. There are a lot of things that people think are in the Bible that aren't there. I've heard some interesting quotations from people trying to teach me about what is in the Bible. Cleanliness is next to godliness. I wish it was in the Bible, but it isn't there. And some other things that people think are in the Word of God that, that are not there, and some things that are in the Word of God that they should know are there, and we should know. That's either amen or ouch, one or the other. But this one is one that you've heard probably prior to this, and it says this, greater love has no man than this, no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Today we're, we're going to use this opportunity to obviously emphasize Memorial Day. There are some that would be uh, distraught over that, they would no doubt entitle us. There's a new term that they've made up uh, that they have created. It's meant to be a purgative. But it's not actually a, a complimentary term. It's called Christian nationalist. And it's those individuals that dare to connect their Christian faith somehow with what's going on in our nation. And so there's a new derogatory term called Christian nationalist. And so there are some that would probably grind their teeth because of what we have done thus far. But Hold, hold on, those of you that are having a problem with that, hold on, because I think as we go on, you will see that we can blend these two together. But Memorial Day was first known as Decoration Day, and it was officially first recognized in 1868, following the Civil War. And it later became known as Memorial Day, and it was celebrated nationally, but was not really officially made an official holiday, believe it or not, until 1971 and it was declared a national holiday. So it is called Memorial Day. The word memorial, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means something that keeps memory alive. Something that is intended to keep memory alive. So this, this is the purpose, this then is the goal of Memorial Day, was the original goal, and that is to keep something alive, to keep memory alive. Although we'll probably, again, uh, be convinced that uh, others will try to convince you or perhaps will speak and say that we shouldn't be speaking on this subject. I would tell you that I believe that the mere opportunity for us to advertise a worship service and to gather in the open like this in a nation is attributed not only to the blessing of God, but also to the willingness of those down through the centuries who were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice and lay down their lives so that we might be afforded this liberty today. In fact, I tell you, there is, for those of you that think that really elections and politics don't have much to do with how we live in our world or nation, you see it as somewhat as a extraneous option to even vote, that we shouldn't even be involved in this. I've asked them if they would, I, I imposed upon our tech team, I would just like you to see a picture that was taken by satellite at night of North and South Korea. South Korea, as you know, is a free nation. South Korea has the freedom to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of the largest churches in the world are located in South Korea. North Korea, as you know, is under the rule of a tyrant, of a dictator. North Korea is a Marxist government and a communist government. And so we'd just like to put up on the screen a picture, if we could, just for a moment. There is a picture of North and South Korea taken by a satellite at night. 
It's very easy to see. Can you see the parallel? Can you see the line that they defended and that divides North and South Korea? If, if you can't see it, let me enlighten you for a moment. The portion of down towards the bottom of the screen that is lit up and has light is South Korea. The dark area that you can't even tell looks like it's ocean. That is North Korea. Hence, you see a graphic image of the result of politics and the result of government. And we thank God that we are in a nation where I am able to speak with liberty still to declare the word of God. Do you, do you agree with that? Well, across the years, it's been easy for us as Americans, the majority of us as Americans, quite frankly, to take for granted the fact that we're enjoying what we enjoy today, that we can vote freely in elections, we still, can vote freely in elections, that we can drive from state to state without going through checkpoints, that we can celebrate Memorial Day with an abundance of food and hot dogs and hamburgers and the grill. And I, I was actually traveled back to my home area. Pam and I traveled back to our home area yesterday to visit some relatives and to do some, do some necessary things with our parents and uh, I, saw, I saw even yesterday, more than once, I went past a, a home and there was a, uh, some smoke ascending from some type of instrument of which there was a sweet savor of a sacrifice taking place. And it was uh, a hamburger or hot dog or a steak if they were able to afford it. And so we have the abundance today and it's very easy for us to lose the fact amidst the potato salad and potatoes and baked beans and all of the wonderful things we're going to hopefully eat, to lose the fact that this is not a weekend to celebrate. We, we quite often slip into that, that mode. It's easy to do. We may wish each other a happy Memorial Day weekend, and it's easy to do that. We want to compliment someone or we want to tell them to have a great holiday. But really, the, the reason for this weekend is not so that we feel good and so that we celebrate. The reason for this weekend is for us to purposely take time and purposely for a few moments, at least at some point, make ourselves feel uncomfortable get ourselves out of the celebratory mode and recognize that there was a very, very dear price that was paid for our liberty. And so that's the subject of today's message. Um, it's to bring us back, if we could, purposely, at least once a year, to remember why we're here, how we got here, and the price that men and women down through the centuries have paid. History is important, ladies and gentlemen. History is so vital and core to what a nation is and to where that nation is going. If you can erase the history of a nation, then you can, you can give them, you can take away their compass and you can cause them to go any direction in the future. In fact, George Orwell, the almost prophetic writer of 1984, the book 1984, said that the most effective way to destroy people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. And that's exactly why we have Memorial Day. I, I remember many years ago, as a little boy, it's a faint memory with me, but I remember dad loading the family into a 1957, 1958 rather, Chevy station wagon, and driving us down to his hometown in Kentucky. And for the purpose of meeting relatives I had never met, uh, meet his aunt and his uncle, and he uh, loved them dearly. And so it was, it was a chance for us to meet relatives we had never met. I remember being amazed that at the breakfast table down there in Kentucky, my aunt put tomatoes on the table for breakfast. I had never as a little boy seen tomatoes served for breakfast, but what a breakfast it was. But at one point during that visit, my dad took us to some point in that little town to a prominent intersection of that town. And we got out of the car and we went up to a statue, a large, large statue of a GI standing in that little town. And my dad explained to me and to us as a family that he had gone to school with this person. He went to elementary school with them. And he told us their, his name, said he was a dear buddy of his who had gone into World War II and had received the Medal of Honor. The statue was there in that town, is still there today, because he had received the Medal of Honor for his actions. His actions were that a hand grenade fell into the foxhole with him and his buddies, 
And without thinking twice, he threw his body on top of that foxhole and gave his life for his friends and ultimately gave his life for liberty. Jesus said in our scripture, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. It made an impression upon me as a little boy. I've thought about it many times since. It made an indelible impression upon me. And I think one of the things that is our responsibility today is unpleasant as it is, we need to educate our children, our grandchildren, on what this is all about and on the price that is paid. It, it is with great consternation that I see a, a weakened version of Memorial Day now even on the airwaves and even even on television and the emphasis on the day, it seems like we are less and less, oh, every once in a while, there'll be a little insertion of, of thank you, happy Memorial Day, thank you for this, that, or the other. But, but we need to be dedicating more time as to what this is all about. So saying that, let me give you some quick points as to what we need to remember as we remember. Number one, the individuals that we're remembering, we need to remember they gave their lives for their families, friends, and liberties. Now, our liberty. Now, there is some very clear distinction here in this that it may seem simplistic to you, but I want us to recognize that Memorial Day is to remember those who, number one, gave their lives, and number two, gave their lives for families, friends, and liberty. There's a lot of confusion around Memorial Day as to what it means. Many confuse this day with Veterans Day, and we're thankful for every veteran that's present here today. Can you say amen to that? We thank We're so grateful to our veterans and for those who serve and have served us. We're grateful for our first responders. I just went to a memorial service this past week at the Salem uh, or Golf Club and uh, to the Memorial Day for those who have fallen in the line of duty for our first responders. I, I, we sat there for a solemn 10 to 15 minutes as one name was read right after another without break of those police officers, detectives, those who, who, have, who serve us as first responders uh, as their names were read without break that have, that have died in the line of service just this past year in our nation. We thank God for them. But today, we're not honoring veterans. We're going to honor veterans in November. It's going to be an awesome day. We already have some special things planned and some special guests coming for that day. But many confuse this day with Veterans Day. This is not Veterans Day. This is a day to honor those who died, those who gave their lives, who paid the ultimate price. Hundreds of thousands of grave markers around the world mark the body of a fallen hero. Physical reminders of the long line of those who came before us and paid a price for us to be here today. But it's also for those, not just those who died. There's a lot of could died. There are, there's a lot of confusion I've noticed among people that, that they remember their, uh, their family members who died. This is not a day for memory of those who have died in the past. It's very specific. This is a day in which we remember those who died for friends, for their families, for ultimately for our liberty, for our country. We are, not, we are not remembering everyone who died. We're reflecting upon those who died for our freedoms and our way of life. You know, there's many reasons, many motivations. I've talked to soldiers down through the years and there's many motivations for soldiers to risk their lives and ultimately to give their lives uh, in an act, in a moment, to battle until the end. Quite often I will hear that it's for their, for their fellow soldiers. There's a, there's a bond that is forged in the military that is very difficult to explain. My father speaks of it often. He was in during the Korean War and, and he still speaks at 95 years of age, he still speaks about the men that he served with and talks about them frequently. There's a tie there that is difficult to describe. And many veterans will, will, that, that interviewed recognize, including the one that my father took me to, his buddy, his, his childhood friend, gave his life. Ultimately, at that moment, I would assume it wasn't he was thinking about America and our liberty. He was thinking about saving the lives of his friends. Ultimately, also, there are those who gave their lives because they connected what they were doing with the freedom and the protection of their family back home. 
There have been bodies that have been found more than once with a picture, perhaps a blood-stained picture still grasped in their hand on the body of that soldier who has died as recognizing, of course, it becoming abundantly clear that the, what they had done is in their last moments, they had wanted to look again fondly on their family or on their wife or on their husband as, as life was ebbing out of their body. They gave their lives for friends or for family. And ultimately, though, as we trace it back, they raised their hand and, and pledged to uphold the Constitution so that they could defend this nation, the United States of America, not just a nation, but what that nation stands for. You dig down deep into the core of their reason, and, it, and it's multifaceted, hard to explain, hard to put into words. But it is because of the liberty, because of what we enjoy today, and often take so for granted, that they gave their lives, that they pledged that they would be willing to do so. So today we remember those who gave their lives, not just, not just those who served, as grateful as we are, but those who gave their lives and gave their lives for the cause. And then secondly, we remember those who gave their lives because they deserve our honor and respect. They deserve our honor and respect. And the Bible tells us in Romans 13, 7, give to everyone what you owe them. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. And today and tomorrow, we give respect and honor to those who deserve it. Now, we must recognize that all who have died in the line of service for their country are due this respect, not just those that, that are somehow enshrined in a statue or those who won medals for hero, her, heroism or those whose face perhaps is characterized in a plaque. But today we give respect to all who died in defense and in protection of their nation and of their country, for all who gave their lives, even those, the many, many, many whose bodies have never been recovered, that are still considered missing in action. That's one of the reasons our nation has the tomb of the unknown in Washington, D.C. My wife and I have been there. What a moving, the changing of the guard, what a moving, if you've not seen it, a moving uh, uh, ritual and, and moving ceremony that is. If you haven't been there, you need to make sure that before you die, you need to go and look at that uh, tomb, but also stay for the changing of the guard. It is incredibly moving because that tomb represents individuals that we don't even know who they are, but God knows who they are. God knew them and God knows them and they were willing to lay down their life and they're deserving of our honor and respect. And we deserve to honor and respect them, all of them, because why? Because they were Americans. We recognize they were individuals. It's easy for us to lose in the, in the, in the statistics, that hard, cold statistics. It's easy for us to lose sight of the fact that these were young people. These were individuals who had hopes, who had dreams, who had aspirations. Some had left careers, some were, some were looking forward to being educated and living a long life. They had family, many had children. Some were teenagers, many were teenagers. And they were willing to give their life at the very beginning, at the very height, at the very peak of, of their physical prowess, at the very peak of their lives, they were willing to lay it down for us. But, but we need to also recognize wholesale. We, we don't worry as much, not because we're insensitive, but we don't worry as much about whether they were male or female or what color they were or where they hailed from or what their background was or what their religion was. We don't worry about what their politics was. We don't care about that, if we may use that word with respect. Why? Because they all represent one thing. They represent America. Because with all of their differences, they represent that they were Americans. And they deserve our honor and our respect. At one, <laughs> at one time, America was known as the melting pot. That phrase comes, by the way, from Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson in, 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 a, uh, in an article that he had written in 1874. 
Ralph Waldo Emerson was talking about the great influx of immigrants into our nation. And he said, and I quote, the fusing process goes on as in a blast furnace. And it transforms the English, the German, the Irish immigrant into an American. And we were called the melting pot. And we see this phrase today, if you use that phrase today, it has become a, a, a phrase of many, many see it as repulsive and offensive. But an increase and an increasing number of people, including many on our college, liberal college campuses, see that as offensive, that we should all be considered one in a nation. But it was not seen that way by the millions down through the years that entered this nation years ago who sought refuge and sought liberty on our shores. They were proud to become citizens. They were proud, they desired to be American. It was their deep heartfelt desire. And they left all that they had, arriving many times only with a suitcase, and they came in through the front door, not the back door. They came in through the front door to become a citizen of the United States. They didn't find it offensive. They were proud to say that they were an American. And I would submit to you that if we're going to survive as a nation, somehow with the help of God and with the assistance of stubborn people who still believe in the core values of America, we are going to have to return to that point where we recognize each other's differences, we recognize individuality, we do not erase that, but ultimately, we're glad to be Americans. And, and even more than that, we are proud to be a Christian and a follower of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, they died for an exceptional nation. Yes, you heard me say that. I said that out loud. They died for an exceptional nation. American exceptionalism is the belief that the United States is either distinctive or unique or exemplary compared to other nations. Now by the word exceptional, we're not using that, we're using that in a descriptive sense, if I may in describing what is different and unique about America. And ladies and gentlemen, America is different and unique from any and every other nation in the world. We are different because, and by the way, once upon a time, hardly anyone would have ever disagreed with that, with the proposition that we are an exceptional nation, for better or worse. We've had our times, we've had our difficulties, we've went through our struggles, as you know, if you know American history. And by the way, they're not teaching American history anymore. They seem to be teaching the history of other nations. And our, our young people, many of them, if you've watched any of these interviews out on the street or on the beaches during spring break, they are woefully undereducated in regards to the history of this nation. Their answers are, are tragically comic. It is incredible their lack of knowledge as who we are as a nation. It, is no, it, it should be no surprise to us that we are facing a crisis of commitment and patriotism among our young people, not all of them. Thank God for those who are still enlisting or still willing to, to serve their country, fine young people. But there are many, many who are coming out of our colleges and universities that don't have a clue about the history of the United States of America. But I tell you the truth, the history of our, our nation is, is one that is exceptional despite our faults. We are a nation that even went to war with itself to try to correct one of the major faults that was many, many decades in coming and our forefathers saw it ine inevitable that we were headed towards a crisis. No other nation does that. And yet we were seeking to bring ourselves onto the right course. Our exceptionalism is recognized by others. Even Joseph Stalin, arch enemy of the United States of America, admitted as much when he reputedly shouted something like, away with this heresy of American exceptionalism in response to the report that despite underground efforts by communist individuals who had been planted in the United States to try to turn American workers 
to, to a Marxism and to get them to support a Marxist, Marxist uh, regime or a Marxist agenda. And the report came back to him that the American workers were not going to be turned. He became angry and he said, away with this, enough of this heresy of American exceptionalism. He couldn't get America to follow. Now what he could not accomplish in that day unfortunately and frighteningly so has has taken a hold in our nation as has been recently demonstrated to the nth degree on our campuses individuals crying out for marxism individuals and hamas supporting hamas blatantly not not in a hidden manner the only thing that's hidden is their face because they're too cowardly to expose their face and show what their who they are but they stand and, and boldly and blatantly support Marxism and communism and Hamas who are heretical and demonic in their agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, we had better wake up and we'd better wake up quickly. I, I am in total agreement with the pastor who recently said, we have educated our children in schools that have turned them against us. And he said this, he said, why should we be surprised if we send our children to Caesar that they become Romans? And ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what has happened. While we have, while we have been playing our fiddle and while we've been enjoying our vacations, someone has been eating away at the fabric and the foundation of our nation and causing a whole generation or two to be bent towards Marxism and communism. That which Stalin could not accomplish has undeniably taken hold in our nation in an alarming, to an alarming degree. And we had better wake up because it is very, very frightening. English writer G.K. Chesterton, Chesterton, by the way, who was English, as I just said, famously observed regarding America, he admitted, by the way, in case you don't know it, the English is who we battled to win our independence from. G.K. Chesterton said, America is the only nation in the world that has and was founded on a creed. The only nation in the world that was founded on a creed. This creed is most clearly set forth in the Declaration of Independence, as you know, by which the American colonies announced their separation from Great Britain. Chesterton was referring to the Declaration. The Declaration is a timeless statement of inherent rights and the proper purposes of government and limits on political authority. It is based upon an amazing supposition that the government should be of the people and by the people and for the people. This is an amazing step that was taken by our forefathers. No other nation. There may have been some that have followed in our footsteps, but this was paving a new way, and many thought it was a dangerous way of liberty and freedom. And they didn't think it was called the American experiment, and they didn't think the experiment would last. We are an exceptional nation. I say it without embarrassment, and I say it without, without apology. We are an exceptional nation, but many today, to many today, that's fighting words, and they will take you to task for that. I, in a recent Brookings Institute article I read online, this was the title, The U.S. is Leaving Millions Behind. American Exceptionalism Needs to Change by 2030. You say, why would they say that? Well, because we have fallen behind on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. That's called SDG. And the international global community, listen to this, expects us to get with it. Because according to them, we are not only not exceptional, we are failing according to their criteria. May I tell you that I could care less about what the UN thinks about where we stand on their criteria. I see you feel that way too. And you, you laugh and say, who cares? Well, I would tell you there's an increasing number of quote unquote citizens of America who care. An increasing number of individuals that have displayed what they feel about it, most recently in the riots and as I said on the campuses and the protest and draping our statues in the flags of, of Hamas 
and all that is going on, this is an evidence that, ladies and gentlemen, there is a real, real argument taking place, there's a real battle taking place over who we are as America. The future of our country depends on what Americans do next. Lastly, and by the way, simply because I say America is an exceptional country, do not misconstrue that I believe that we are eternal in our existence. Simply because we're exceptional does not mean that we cannot fail. It does not mean that we cannot fall. Empires that were world sweeping in their power and that lasted hundreds and hundreds of years fell because they failed to heed the warning signs that came their way. And when destruction came, it came quickly. It was almost as if, the, like the poet said of the sunrise, it came gradually and then quickly. And it is that which is upon us if we are not careful. The only nation in the world that is ever guaranteed within the Bible of lasting is Israel, not the United States of America. So lest our arrogance cause us to fall, we need to make sure that we recognize the Bible is true. And the Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And we need to recognize that. Lastly, it's up to us to make sure that these that we honor and respect have not died in vain. In Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, in a cemetery, President Abraham Lincoln gave a speech that was only a few minutes long, and he sat down next to the other orator who, had spoken, who would speak for two hours. And Abraham Lincoln gave a speech of a few words, and he sat down, and the orator next to him congratulated him, and he looked at him and he said, I'm afraid that speech won't scowl. Now that's an old-fashioned term. Scowl means that it, you, it, it's scowling back then was getting the mud off of a shovel. And he said, I don't believe that speech will scowl. A peculiar phrase, but it became his most famous speech. In the Gettysburg Address on that day in the Gettysburg Cemetery, gathered where they were in the midst of thousands of graves, he said this to the people there, and I would say that he would say it to us here gathered today. He said, it is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation shall have a new birth of freedom and the government of the people by the people and for the people shall not perish from the earth. You and I have a responsibility as we remember those who have given their lives and today and a beautiful day and this weekend and the opportunity to, with all that we have, we need to recognize that we have a responsibility. Those who died are saying honor us by sacrificing today for a better tomorrow. Well, as we close, I would be amiss if I did not point out that we're gathered here to worship the Lord God Almighty. And there was another person who died and gave his life whose death we take time to remember as well today. Because it is inexorably linked and intertwined with that verse that we read, that lay down their life for their friends. Regardless of how noble the death was or the deaths were of those that we remember in regards to our nation today, his sacrifice is vastly superior to any other death that has been given in a cause and nobly and sacrificially. Why would you say that? Well, let me do a little comparative, quick closure, a comparative point. Number one, Jesus gave his life not only for his friends and family and liberty, but he gave his life for his enemies. He didn't just die for friends or family or liberty. He died for those who were spitting on him, who had driven the nails through his hands, who hated him. He died for you and I. In while we were yet sinners, we were yet enemies, the Bible says in Romans 5.10. When you and I were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? 
Another verse says, in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you and I when we were his enemy, when we wanted nothing to do with him, when we were running from him. And even those today who curse his name, just this past week, uh, we were at a, at, a, at a market, an outdoor market. And a lady, we heard, I wouldn't call her a lady, I, I assume she was female, if I can say that in this day of wokeism, but she began to curse the name of Jesus, just use the foulest language. You know, ladies, I want to say this to you. There was a time that I remember and I recall when a lady wouldn't use language like that. There was a time when we hadn't grown so crude in the United States of America where there was such a thing as obscenity, there was such a thing as vulgarism, we were taught, I remember even people who didn't go to church, the family that I was raised next to. I remember watching the screen door pop open and those boys one by one that I grew up with and, and, and just went everywhere with and we just were such buddies. I remember watching them pop out of that door and their mouth was foaming because mom had washed their mouths out with soap because of the language they were using. There was a day when you didn't use that language, but there's something particularly stabbing to me when you use my Lord's name in vain. If it's in a, if it's, I tell you this, if it's in a movie, I don't care how wrapped up I am in that movie and how badly I want to see the end of it. If they curse my Lord's name, it's off. I turn it off. I don't watch it. I take the DVD out. I put it in that and I get angry about it. I will not let them use my Lord's name in vain. And listen, that is inspired by the devil straight from hell just to get us exposed to taking his name in vain. That is who inspires that type of language. And I will not listen to it. And it's about time for us as quote unquote Christians to gut up and say that I'm going to be alleged to my Lord more than I am to how great a movie is that Hollywood put out. Now that wasn't in my notes, but it was free. And that's where we stand on it. Jesus gave his life not only for his friends, he gave it for his enemies. Number two, Jesus doesn't just deserve our honor and respect. He deserves our love and worship. He deserves our love and worship. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God our Father. He deserves our worship. He deserves more than just our respect. He deserves our worship and our love and our commitment and our consecration. Thirdly, Jesus just didn't die for an exceptional nation. He died for an eternal kingdom. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end, Isaiah said. And in 2 Peter 1, 10 and 11, for if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then lastly, it's up to us to make sure he didn't die in vain. You know, if, if you came to church today to be entertained, you came to the wrong place. Because I'm not going to let us go without a challenge. That we somehow have failed to transfer our faith into the culture and society around us. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.17, he was not going to use man's words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. You and I need to make sure the cross is not emptied of its power. Somehow, not just recently, over the decades, we have gone to church. We've kind of checked that off our list. We said, man, on Memorial Day weekend, I went to church. And I'm grateful for that. I'm thankful. You could have been many other places, and many are. They've chosen to go somewhere else. But you made the choice to be here. But, but ladies and gentlemen, going to church, attending church, that has kind of been the standard, that that's been the ceiling of what we thought we had to hit all the way down through the decades. And we have failed miserably to transfer what we have received here. We've kind of thought it was up to the professional Christian. It was up to the pastor. It was up to the Billy Grahams. It's up to those individuals to, to transfer that out into society. And yet the Bible teaches over and over again, that's not the case. The Bible says you are the salt of the earth. The Bible says you are the light of the world. And you, not, you must rub up against. But, but somehow we have failed to do that, whether that's because of fear of offending, 
of being considered closed-minded, of not being considered inclusive, fear of being rejected, not just rejected by those we work with, but rejected by our own families in many cases. So we stay silent at the family gatherings when something that is antagonistic to Jesus or antagonistic to the teachings of the word. And we know it, but somehow we don't want to ruin the holiday. We don't want to mess everything up. Or maybe we're just afraid we won't be invited back to the next gathering. Or maybe we won't be invited to the next dinner by our friends or the next special event. And so we remain silent. And over the years, over the decades, our silence has breeded. First of all, it has shown that we're cowards. Secondly, it has breeded in our nation. a a place where they they feel the church has no impact, no effect, and indeed it hasn't. But I tell you, I'm proud of this professional athlete that just recently, Harrison Butler, Butker, we, we, we just, you know, we live in an astonishing time. It's astonishing to me that an athlete giving a commencement speech at a Catholic university, and and it has caused the liberals, their hair is on fire. The woke, the woke crowd is just, they're, they're, they're beating their chest and, and crying out. They just don't know what they're going to do because this professional athlete had the audacity. What did he do? In fact, I'll tell you, one of the, one of the, uh, the popular programs where they sit around on a panel and discuss all of this, they, I, I will quote, they said that he needs therapy for his cult-like faith. He really needs help. And what, what was the offense of this professional athlete in the, in the United States that they're now, now asking the NFL to remove from his position? What, what did he do? Well, first of all, he said he was pro-life. Secondly, he said he was an unashamed Christian. Thirdly, he said that he was grateful for, to his wife for her love and commitment to their children that she was willing to embrace her chosen vocation as a homemaker. And because of that, now we have thousands of the woke generation running around, uh, pulling their hair out, not knowing what they're going to do because he was willing to make a statement. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a crisis in this nation. We are in a genuine crisis that someone can give a testimony. And I'm so proud of this young man because he said he is not backing down and he's not backing off. He's, he meant what he said and he said what he meant. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I need to get off of our sofa, get out of our easy chair, or get out of our car, and we need to make ourselves uncomfortable, and we need to run to the point of contact and be proud and be unashamed that we are Christians and that we stand for what we stand for. If not, we're going to lose this nation. And you can tell it, you can say that you heard it here. We will lose this nation if you and I are not willing to be uncomfortable. And I leave you with this thought. There are millions of graves around the world as testimony of those who are willing to give their life for our liberty. Surely you and I can leave this place today and say that for the sake of our children and our grandchildren, for the sake of liberty and freedom, not just of a nation, but to proclaim the gospel so that we don't lose our freedom and millions don't lose their souls, we're going to stand strong. We're going to stand alongside individuals like this. And even if it comes, let it come. We are unashamed of Jesus. Well, it is, it, we are in a crisis, but thankfully God has not left us powerless. He has not left us impotent and weak. As we have said many, many times, God has given us everything we need to bring back not just a nation, but a society. But it will not be brought back through any special person other than the person of Jesus Christ. And you and I, with him, make a majority. Let's not go afraid. Let's not go distraught. Let's not go feeling as if it's out of control. I think sometimes that's the way people feel, that it's too far gone, that it's done. But let us recognize that in the past, God has renewed and restored and worked miracles. If we had more time, we could go back into our own history. For our fight for independence was first first preceded by the first great awakening. 
in which our nation came back to God in a mighty way. Solzhenitsyn was here, Solzhenitsyn was here, and they asked him, how did Russia become the way it did? And he said that he, he was teaching at a university, and he said, I share this with you, that a little grandmother, I questioned her in the Soviet Union as to how did we get here, and the little grandmother said, I can, I can wrap it up with one phrase, we forgot God. We forgot God. May those who have died not have died in vain, but may you and I commit ourselves to the task that remains before us. Let us not forget God and let us not underestimate him, for our God is God and he is a worker of miracles. We may say it's impossible, but not with our God. May we come to the place where some of you are going to pick those signs up. May we come to the place again where we can truly say that because we repented, because we turned, because we stood up, we are in a place now where we can say, God bless America. And God's blessing will come upon us in full force. And we will be what he would have us to be. God bless you. Thank you for coming. And I pray, I pray, we pray that you have a wonderful day and that tomorrow we reflect upon the price and recognize that we are a blessed people. Can you say amen? We are a blessed people. God bless you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.